Okay, hi everyone, and welcome back to our and welcome to our next session with one of our very very special guests, Ryan O'Hara from Lead IQ. I'm going to do a quick introduction here, and I'm going to pass the mic. So the title of this session is Tactical Tips for Building Pipeline in 2022, and I think this is going to be highly relevant. So any of you that are on the front line or managing the front line, you want to tune in and take your notes here. When sales teams miss their quota, the top reason cited is often a lack of pipeline, and we totally get it. So uh, building pipeline is harder than ever. There's a lot of headwinds that we're facing, but Ryan's here to help us through that. So don't worry. Uh, Ryan's the chief evangelist at Lead IQ, who's one of our platinum sponsors. And he's gonna share with us some tactical tips on how SDRs can use the right, uh, that SDRs can use right away to help build pipeline and crush goals in, in 2022. Thanks Ryan, uh, take away. Hi everyone. So I'm gonna try and fly through stuff extremely quick. Um, just to start with, if you haven't ever heard about Lead IQ before, after this talk, if you end up coming to this talk, we're gonna give you guys a chance to mess around and use Lead IQ um, on freemium. We help companies with making selling personalization and interacting with buyers as easy as possible. And some of the stuff that we talk about today, it's gonna get real. We're gonna see some things, things are gonna be weird, but we're gonna jump into it. Um, if you wanna make that stuff easier, you should definitely go check out Lead IQ. All right, hold on a second, I'm getting my slides to share. This is always really scary. Oh, where did it go? All right, my screen sharing, I'm going into my slides. So here's what we're gonna do guys. To get started, if anyone has any questions, Anthony, who you see is the speaker that's hidden right now, he's right next to me. You can ask Anthony and he'll hit me and bug me to do it. Thanks Anthony, <laughs> good special effects. All right, so a little background on me. Um, this is uh, numbers from me prospecting over the course of four months. I had over a 48% reply rate when I was doing prospecting and an 84% open rate. Um, so. Like I, I do a lot of really creative ideas with prospecting. And what I want to do is get everyone that's here today to think about building pipeline better by being creative and focusing on tasks that take thinking instead of things that should be automated. So let's start. We're just going to jump in with these things. The first thing I want to talk about is when you have people on your sales line, let's say you've got people on your team that cold call somebody and they're like, hey, um, uh, send me more info. They'll say that on the phone. Uh, easy ta tactic to do is ask them, okay, what kind of content would be valuable for you? And if they don't answer that well or whatever they say, when you're actually writing the email, don't just say, okay, thank you, I'll talk to you later. Hype your touches. You wanna hype the email that you're gonna write. Be like, I'm gonna write an email to you. It's gonna be the best email you've ever seen. In the event that uh, you're doing it and you're doing it over LinkedIn or something, instead you could hype it there too as well, but you wanna hype your touch, meaning hype it. Tell them it's gonna be a good message. Tell them you're gonna do something that's really cool. And then actually, <laughs> this is the part that comes together here. You're going to send the greatest email ever? Do it. Live up to the hype. This is a picture of my mom uh, telling me that I'm a huge disappointment, by the way. Um, really sad, really pathetic, but I'm doing great. You got to live up to the hype. You got to remember that the people that you prospect and do, they all have interesting backgrounds. They all got into those buying positions at those companies because they're interesting. Um, what that means for you is that you want to actually figure out a way to seem extraordinary when you're doing your outreach. One of the easiest ways to do that is to... Be really thoughtful with your prospecting. Focus on making the person feel really special and then jump into the things that you talked about when you're doing your outreach. Uh, so this is another thing that actually is hurting sales. I love this picture. So what happened was I was on a Zoom call when the pandemic first hit and I, I my frame froze. Like I had a freeze frame on my Zoom and it looked like I was like DJing an EDM festival. So I photoshopped it to make it look like I'm DJing an EDM festival. I definitely don't DJ. Tactic number four is to keep it real. Don't do gimmicks. So there's a lot of stuff that you'll see out there with blog posts and tricks like use this subject line and say this thing and, and, and come up with the weird gimmick to try and get someone to respond. Like look at this one. Someone wrote recontract. I get a message like this and I'm like, wow, sales rep, you must be thinking of a contract that you're going through in the sales process. Problem is if you go and do stuff like this, it hurts your trust with that buyer and it gives them a bad experience. And here's the other thing. It actually hurts everybody else that works in sales. Average reply rate and connect rate on a cold call, average reply rate is less than 1%. Average connect rate is less than 3%. So we're literally teaching outreach to ignore it. Uh, we're teaching buyers to ignore outreach when we do gimmicks like this. Let's try and keep it real and, be, and, and, and talk with people like we would if you're emailing a friend or a colleague. So what are good subject lines instead? These are little combo stacks to give you more tactics and go through this stuff. Uh, a good subject line should be personalized and vague. So uh, this is something you can look at blog posts everywhere about like, use these 12 subject lines, like ignore that stuff. This has worked over the past 10 years for me. 
Uh, we have people on our team that do the same thing. If it's personalized and vague, what it means is you're going to be writing your cold message about why the prospect's special to you to open up, right? Whatever that topic is, match up that subject line with the, the personalization thing. So if let's say I'm emailing Anthony over here and saying, hey, Anthony, I saw you're a huge fan of Batman. If you want to save your sales team tons of hours like Batman saves people from, you know, Batman. Yeah, you love Batman, right? <laughs> Thanks. It could, I, I knew. He knows. I could he tell. Did his I, knew, research. I knew you were a bat, Batman <laughs> guy. Um, what you can do is you could have, you want to say Batman as a subject line. It's super easy. And then just make sure you mention Batman in your outreach. Um, the other cool part is I tell people to lead with an email because when you do your cold call, just reference back the personalization and research you already did the first time. Another thing a good email does is it sets the expectation of your cold email's body. So what this means basically is you want to try and make it so that when you're going through the body of a cold email, um, it it matches up with it. Because how would you like it if I wrote an email that was like, your kid's sick at the hospital, and then you open the email and it has nothing to do with your kid being sick at the hospital. That's like really dishonest and bad. You want to make the subject line more about the prospect than you. Don't use marketing speak, meaning don't type it like a marketer. Don't type it with proper pronunciation and uppercase and grammar and stuff. Like write like how you would write actually if you're writing to somebody. And make it something you'd want to receive in the inbox. That's kind of how I tackle these things. I had a really good open rate tack, like kind of following this approach, and I, I it can work really well for you. Tactic number 11 is don't be a creep. You want to line up your value prop based on your research. So a lot of people will go personalize something like, hey, Ryan, I saw you're a New England Patriots fan. Wanted to talk to you about marketing automation. And like you don't say anything that actually lines it up. If you make your value prop related to the personalization item that you use, you're way more likely to actually get a good response. This is me creeping behind the bushes, by the way. So just shout out to me. Good job. So tactic 12, don't fake personalization. So you want to be specific when you do your reach out. Um, I'll give you an example. I get LinkedIn messages all the time. I'm, this is for everything, by the way. Hey, Ryan, I noticed we share some connections and looking to grow my network of professionals. I'd love to connect. This is fake personalization. Like, it's not detailed. It, if you really did the research, just go a couple seconds later. Don't do the fake personalization. How many people are like, hey, Ryan, saw your VP of marketing. I'm like, wow, that's really cool, right? Or, hey, Ryan, uh, saw, your new, like, saw you live in New England. And you have to then make it relevant and be more specific about stuff. So... Tactic 13 is to talk about what you found researching your prospect. And that's kind of, that's kind of a good way of thinking about this. Like whatever you just, you discovered, that's a good way of going into the, the discovery of this stuff and what you actually say. I'll give you a really good example. Let's pretend that I was prospecting Danny Hudo who works at Gong. If you look at Danny, Danny Hudo's LinkedIn profile, uh, shout out to Danny, shout out to Gong. What's up guys. Um, if you actually go look at Danny's LinkedIn profile, Danny has a lot of really cool experiences. One of the experiences that I found that was always really interesting is that Danny uh, was a uh, roadie for uh, the guys that packed the disco, right? Kind of cool background. Now he's an event manager. He makes decisions on how Gong spends their event budget. I would actually, instead of saying, hey, Danny, saw you were a roadie. I don't know if roadie is the right term, by the way. It might be, I don't know. I don't know if there's a more no. modern term. Yeah, there's probably a better term than that. Basically, he would sell merch for the band and stuff and tour with them. And, like, he'd go to be on a tour bus with them. Um, I would actually talk about Panic of the Disco instead of what he just did. So if you do that in your prospecting, you're way better and you'll be in a better perspective to actually personalize it. The easiest way to get out of the habit of this is start with I saw. One tip I heard from the guys at Jay Barrows is to say you at the beginning of your message. That helps too. Read your post about, noticed you talked to Sarah a few months ago. I heard you, specific name told X about you. If you start your cold emails this way, it's going to accidentally make you personalize and accidentally reveal what you did to do the actual research. Um, and that's it. That's a big part. Be detailed. I didn't say, what. you know how many people write emails to me and say, noticed, uh, hey, Ryan, I noticed that you talked with a colleague a couple months ago. Why would you say a colleague? Who do we call out the person? Like be specific and it's way better. It's more detailed. Um, we, I accidentally put 15 twice because I'm a jerk. I'm sorry, everybody. Tactic 15, this is technically tactic 16. Don't pitch in your LinkedIn connection request. So uh, in, in this is something I see a lot of the time. You send a connection request with someone. I like the old medieval shall the accept that LinkedIn request. It makes me, uh, makes me happy. Um, 
what I would do is I use LinkedIn more for nurturing. So if I'm going to add a connection request, I usually like just mentioning what made me notice the person. How did I find them? Yeah, I was poking around. Don't be like, I was poking around at similar profiles. Like that's another example of not being detailed enough. Say something that calls out that you actually read their profile. Like that's a really easy way to do this. And don't pitch in the connection request about connecting solutions and all that stuff. It doesn't work. Uh, this is an example of one. Hey, Ryan, I ran across your company and uh, I wanted to reach out to you and connect. It looks like we have some synergies between our two companies. This isn't going to work. Like, I'm, the, I, I, yeah, let me accept so you can pitch me and bombard me with stuff over and over again. Uh, so now we're back on 17. I totally messed up these numbers, by the way. It was me. Um, tactic 17. Instead, reference something personal about how you found them. It's a really easy tactic on this end. When you get accepted on LinkedIn, I don't use LinkedIn as my channel to do my first pitch. What I do is I use LinkedIn later on. What I would do instead is make your first touch, your best one, do it over email. And then after you do it over email, do your follow-up over call. I like using LinkedIn to kind of nurture the relationship and build that up um, as opposed to uh, something else. We have some questions. Oh, we have some questions. To... We're flying at a good pace, right? We are, I think. All right, we're going to go through some questions here. Let's read. Go ahead. Uh, send them. Where did we go? What about? Okay. We're, we're going through questions, guys. One sec. I derailed. All right, we're losing questions. It's falling apart. Yeah, I think it went to the QA. Hold okay, on. okay. I'll look it up. We'll get to questions in a minute. Let me keep going a little bit. So, tactic 20. Say your name last when you leave a voicemail. I actually stole this from a workshop I went to at the John Barrows. People, it's really funny. The reason you say your name last is when someone reads a voicemail, they're usually reading it, re reading it over text. So you want them to get to the message. First thing I'm wondering when I listen to a voicemail is, who's leaving me this voicemail? So don't spill the beans at the beginning of the voicemail. It's a pattern interrupt. If you do this, I, I can say, oh, person's telling me bye, and I'll delete it. But if I look at it, the other thing is people are consuming these voicemails, usually with the transcription service to read the transcription of it. And if you did something over email, this is a huge mistake I see a lot of people do. They don't acknowledge the cool thing that they did in the email over voicemail during their follow-up. So if I sent Anthony a video of my dog Finnegan being really cute and doing something cool because I saw that Anthony has a dog, and I leave a voicemail, I'm going to reference back that, hey, I sent you a video with a dog in it. You see, I see so many people that like, we'll, we'll talk to you that like, we'll do something so cool on their first touch and then completely bail on it afterward. Tactic 22, and this one's really obvious. You want to be yourself. If you have reps on your team and you're making them speak the language of marketing, the only thing that you want to align with is value props because those value props have been proven out with product marketing, sales enablement, and your sales team. You don't want them freelancing on that end. But what you want them to do is let them find a way to make a connection with somebody on their personalization with their own experiences. For example, I like making videos and stuff. I put a lot of videos on LinkedIn. This is my film setup that I used to have in my office. I play piano. I might bring that up when I do outreach if I see someone who's a musician or mention something in their profile. I own a moped and clearly don't know where the road is in this picture. Um, so that's a good example of this. Um, I have two corgis. This is this is Ruby and this is Finnegan. I actually have three now. I need to update the third one. Um, and I love the actor Bill Paxton. May he rest in peace. Very good, very good actor. Underrated. Uh, love Bill Paxton. Favorite role for him is probably True Lies, but you get the idea. If I were prospecting somebody, and I, I, I'm going to mention these things to the person if I see that they have something that I can relate it to in my value prop. So putting yourself into your prospecting is what will make you unique. What's up, Anthony? Oh, I thought we had, I'm going to keep going. Okay, cool. I thought you had questions. Uh, tactic 23 is to put yourself in your prospecting to find common ground. So what we did is we've done studies at Lead IQ. There's kind of three layers of personalization here. There's personalization 1.0. That's when you prospect someone based on their title and the company they work for. You can do that. And most companies are doing that. That'll get you a three to 5% reply rate. If you do tech, uh, personalization 2.0, that's when you prospect the individual based on their interest, uh, things that you think would be interesting to them, that you notice that's unique about them. A lot of people are doing that today. The third is personalization 3.0. And personalization 3.0 is really, really cool. It's where you take something that you have in common with a prospect and you bring that up in your prospecting. For example, if I wanted to email Anthony and Anthony lives in New Jersey, and I've been to some really cool places in New Jersey, I might say, hey, Anthony, saw you lived in New Jersey. 
when I went to New Jersey, I remember I went to this really cool garden place over the border in Pennsylvania called Loganwood Gardens. It's like a beautiful garden that DuPont's used to own. Have you ever been there? I wanted to ask you something really quick. What are you doing to grow weed lists like the gardens that grow along with gardens? See, right there, I'm finding a way to relate common ground into my value prop. And that's kind of the fun game about prospecting is it's a thinking person's game. Um, so find common ground and put it in. You'll get a higher reply rate. Um, this is an example of it. Me mentioning uh, a mitt at Sendergen, I found out he had a corgi. And so I emailed him and I mentioned that I had two corgis at home. And I sent a video of Finnegan running across the field and uh, in slow motion to chariots of fire. Bottom line, I use this to relate to admit, and I got the reply and I got the meeting from it. Tactic 24 is you want to focus on director level or below. That's when you can focus on the person's individual interest. You can do the company interest with C-suite. C-suite cares a lot more about the company. I will note there's an exception. CFOs tend to care a little bit more about themselves. It's not knocking CFOs. If you're out there right now, I'm not trying to put you down CFO, but I know CFOs have a lot of tendency to focus on keeping costs under control, but uh, you line up more individual interest if you're doing people that are below director, uh, director or below. The VPs and higher up, they'll care a little bit more about the tactics and initiatives that are happening with companies. Now, tactic number 25 is to focus on asking for a referral, but instead of just asking for a referral, ask for a specific person. If I went to Anthony right now and said, hey, Anthony, do you know anyone that could use Lead IQ? Anthony's gonna stare at me for 20 minutes. And it's going to be hard for him. Instead, go on LinkedIn Sales Navigator, go to Anthony's connections, click into it, look at the list of his connections and ask for specific people that you want to get an introduction for. This is one for managers. So get your math and your calculators out. Um, instead of looking at just response rates and opportunities and stuff, you can actually measure your reps effectiveness with something called a prospecting efficiency score. What we recommend doing is you take the number of responses that somebody has and divide it by the number of touches. That's your response rate. Multiply that by the number of opportunities someone has divided by the number of responses they have. The cool part is with cross multiplication, you can get rid of literally both the number of responses in this case. And it's just this. How many touches does it take to get an opportunity? The reason that you should care about this is if this number is too high, we will run into uh, an issue where you could be hurting your brand's reputation if you're doing a lot of touches and not getting enough opportunities. If this number is too low, let's say you're doing a lot, very few touches and you're not getting a lot of opportunities, you need to figure out how to make the rep more efficient with their process and what they're doing. And that's something you should always be looking for bottlenecks for. If you want to talk to us about that, come to our booth after we can help you with that step too. Real quick, I just want to touch on one thing. If someone has a high response rate, but a low qualification rate, you spend more time training them on overturning objections and trying to uh, use omni-channel to get more than one response. Tactic number 27 is to lead every touch with why the prospect is special to you. This is really, really important. What a nice photo there. It makes me calm down a little bit in this, in this time. Um, it's the easiest way to personalize. Why is the prospect special to you? Why did you pick them? You could pick anybody today to write an email or do a call with. Why did you pick them? If you start that way, you're going to get an engaging and interesting conversation with someone. And, you know, this is the old way that people used to sell. We have so much information about people today online. Tactic number 20 is to prospect LinkedIn engagements. So in this case, you want to have your reps posting every six days online. It could be text post, personal antidotes, story, anything like that. Post something every six days. Any of the engagements that you get literally could turn into a prospect list. And then you could go and prospect them. If you want to capture some of those people into some leads and stuff, you should come to our booth and talk about lead IQ and capturing LinkedIn engagements. Underrated thing you can do here. Tactic number 29 is to ask open-ended questions. This is on the phone. This is how I end emails. I know that you'll use stuff like Crystal Nose and they're like, be direct. But when you ask an open-ended question, here's what happens with cold email. I write a cold email to someone and say, can I have 15 minutes to chat? I'm either going to hear yes or I'm going to hear no. Or I'm going to hear no response at all. If I ask an open-ended question, what are your thoughts on chatting? There's a psychological phenomenon that happens where the buyer is more likely to reply back and give you information. Maybe they'll say, hey, I'm not the right person or, hey, I'm interested or whatever they're going to say. Ask them for their thoughts. Ask them, how does that sound? Ask them an open-ended question that relates to your business and that can work really well too. So we're going to try, we try to make personalization, interacting with buyers, all that stuff as easy as possible. You can come to our booth and what we're going to do is if you 
respond to us by next Friday when we write an email to you, we're going to give you 100 captures that you can use with Lead IQ. Those captures let you take any prospect you find on LinkedIn. You can literally send it into uh, any sales tool that you use so that you can go prospect them. One click, you can add them to sales engagement. If your reps are looking at this and they're like, I do a lot of data entry every day, they're not going to want to work there if the other companies are doing this. So it's really important to think through that. Um, I want to go through some questions. I can also tell you guys some other tips if you want. Um, what do we think? What's what's the chatter? Uh, let's see. Um, we have a lot of good questions. All right, let's rifle through it. Can All you right. guys hear Anthony or should I move it? Do you want to move over here, Anthony, for the yeah, questions? Top one. Uh, I'd love some tips on opening up uh, that conversations after they've, they've accepted the LinkedIn connection. I feel that I get uh, standard, I'm happy to connect and uh, nothing after that. Yeah, so here's a cool little tip that I recommend. When you're actually asking someone on LinkedIn, they accept your connection request, go to their activity on social if they have activity and ask them their opinion on something. See what they engaged with and ask an opinion on something. Um, sorry, am I supposed to do something? Oh, cool. Okay. So that's what I would do. Like, good example. Hey, blah, blah. Saw you posted or saw in your social activity, you talked about X topic. Well, I want to know what your opinion is on it. What do you think of this trend that's happening? And if you need help getting some of those trends, go bug your product marketing team. They usually have a lot of really cool info that you can get. If you don't have product marketing, just Google the word trends in space at the person that you're adding on and then ask their opinion on something. Don't sell yet on LinkedIn. What you do is you do that and they get familiar with your name going back and forth, sharing commentary on stuff. And then when you call them, they'll recognize your name. And if you write an email, the friendly from address in the inbox will actually see that too. Um, all right, let's, uh, how much time do we got left? We have about a little under 10 minutes. All right, guys, let's fly through some of these. Courtney asked, how can you personalize if the prospect is not on LinkedIn and their site does not have a bug? All right, so Courtney, here's my tip for you on this. What I recommend is if you can't find the prospect online, the fallback option is to talk about their company and current events that might have happened in their company. The other option is if you know the location of where the person lives, here are some areas you can personalize based off. Location, uh, you can look at where they worked before if you happen to know that information. Look at job postings for that company that's hiring. Read the information that they mentioned in the job posting. That stuff's usually really useful for like trying to figure out um, what they're looking for. With Tapcard, I'm guessing you might be going after um, you might be going after like some e-commerce mom and pop shops and stuff. Maybe go look at what they sell. Talk about that stuff. Go look at um, ways that you can uh, bring up their inventory and things that they might have on that end. Um, last source that I'd recommend you some people still have their Facebook profiles a little public. Go to Facebook, click the About section, and see what things they like. If you can match up the person, um, let's do the next question. Anthony, you want to be the asker? I like you being the asker. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have, how do you, which one did you leave off? Oh, so how about this? How do you nurture the relationship on LinkedIn? And if, if they only connected but don't engage, no response to messaging. All right. So this is kind of interesting. If someone doesn't respond on LinkedIn, I, I, I mean, some people are just not going to respond. That's the nature of it. Um, what I'd recommend, again, is look at their social activity. Look for mutual interest. If they add you on LinkedIn, a lot of the time you can see who they're connected with. See if you have mutual connections. See if they have any interaction. Look at their LinkedIn recommendations. See if there's any network effects that you can leverage. Another thing you can do is add all your coworkers at your company on LinkedIn. If you add your coworkers on LinkedIn, you can see if they know anyone at your, your company. Go ask the person at the company uh, about them. If you're not getting a response from someone, but you can get, you're obviously reaching out to more than one person in that company, Go find someone else that works for that company. And here's something that's a really good pattern interrupt. Say, hey, I was talking to this person. What are they like? What are they into? And if they're into something cool, go buy them a package and send them something online. Uh, you can do something like that. You can pick, uh, you could find find something that's unique that, uh, that makes them stop and say, holy crap, that's the purple cow. Uh, there's a marketer named Seth Godin that's really well known. He was one of the early marketers at Yahoo. And he writes this book called The Purple Cow. And the concept basically is you're driving in a field, you see a bunch of white cows, and then you see a purple cow. What do you do? You stop. You take a picture. Um, and you, you you share it, right? Do something extraordinary on that end for that person. Um, I like doing video, for example. Video is really fun for me. I did a campaign once where we uh, were trying to break into a company. And I literally dressed up in a tuxedo and auditioned to be a spokesperson for them. 
Um, like that, that's one idea. And then I sent that in the video and then I call an email and I follow up with them about the video. Um, what do you want to do next? We have time for one more. Okay. So how's about, uh, should you cold call a person after sending an email, even though they haven't opened it yet, according to your tracking software? Yeah. Um, I think you should always cold call somebody. And what you do is you cold call and say, Hey, did you, did you visit the, um, you, you, you just say, Hey, did you, did you happen to check this email yet? If you know the answer is no, be like, Hey, I wrote you an email. Rebring up the personalization that you did in that for in that outreach. If you do that, your talk track will be way better. Open up with a script. Hey, blah blah, uh, something special about them. I noticed you uh, used to work at Banana Republic. I worked at Banana Republic when I was in high school. Like that's a good example. I just made that up on the fly. But like, find that common thing that relates to it, and then be like, well, you remember when you worked at retail? There are all these little painful things you had to do. Well, we help get rid of some of the painful things in sales. Like. You can relate it back to your value prop. Are we have time? time? I'm getting yelled at now. They're telling me, "Where? No, no!" <laughs> they just take me off the screen. Ah! <laughs> um, if you guys have any questions or you want to try stuff, please come to our booth. We want to help everyone be, build world class prospecting organizations. You should totally check out our booth. We'll help you out on there. Um, I'm happy to answer other questions too. When we um, reach out uh, to you guys after the conference, just ask them if they could. You can ask a question to me, and I'll try and get to it for you. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon.